Hello and welcome to Season 2, Episode 28 of the Physician Assistant Exam Review Podcast. This week, we're going to be covering the first half of vascular disorders, and we're going to begin with veins. My name is Brian Wallace. I'm the host and creator here at Physician Assistant Exam Review. You can find all of the notes over at physicianassistantexamreview.com. Uh, you can find everything over there that you're going to be looking for. I've also heard recently from people that some of the older shows are starting to fall out of the podcast um, queue, and you, they're not able to find them. You can find everything over on the website. The feed for the podcast only holds so many shows. Uh, so as I create new shows, the old ones sort of fall out the back end. Uh, it just isn't going to hold them all. So you can always go over to the website and dig those out. I do delete old one, old shows, old notes once I've gone back through season two. So you can go ahead and, you, you know, you're not going to double up on those. But I think um, at this point, I think, uh, I forget what it is. Some, just, people have been emailing me that certain topics are they can't find. And the answer is you, you have to go back over to the website. And uh, as of this recording, there's a search bar uh, in the upper right. So you can just search for that. Or you can, the, the uh, blueprint, there's a, there's a, something in the menu where it says blueprint or site map or something you can click on that and it'll have everything there pretty easily you can find it uh, there so i started this show this podcast this uh whole thing years ago when i had to take my panry and i couldn't find material out there i was looking for audio material i could listen to in the car and there wasn't any there was no podcast there was nothing you could listen to uh while driving which is something i love to do i love i'm an audiobook subscriber i use audible constantly I listen to a fair amount of podcasts now. I'm more into to the audiobooks, but I flip back and forth, and there just wasn't anything for reviewing for my panry and and with little kids and whatnot. I just that was running short on time, and I thought it would make a whole lot of sense. So I started building out this website very very slowly. Uh, it's, it's terrible if you can go back and find episodes, the early episodes. They're they're completely awful. Thankfully, I've been getting feedback from you guys that the show has been getting better. But initially, it just took a long time to start building all this stuff out. And I did it because, like I said, I just couldn't find the material I was looking for. And what this show is about, what this show is for, one is to cover the content material to get you through so that you understand the material. And two is to make you a better overall learner, a better worker, a better a better able to retain information, better able to get more done in a shorter period of time, all of those things, and then the, to culminate in passing your exam. That's what we do here. We get you to pass your exam and become a better learner. This show is not about being a good clinician. Now, there are shows out there for that, and I'm thankful for those now. Um, They're great. I think you should definitely go subscribe to those, and they do a wonderful job. But that's not what we're here to do. That's not what this show is about. That's not our main focus. Our main focus is getting you to be a better learner, a better uh, have better habits, better ways of retaining information, and then ultimately to pass your exam. So for today's show, what we're going to do is we're going to be covering venous disorders. I'm going to do this in a small chunk because I want it to be very clear. I don't want to throw too much information at you, especially if you're driving your car or out for a jog. I want you to be able to retain the information that we're covering here today. And that's one of the main focuses for me as I go through this. Now, I used to be an educator. I used to teach uh, high school chemistry and biology compared to a classroom of 26, 27 freshmen and sophomores Doing this into my microphone in my in my house is a little bit easier, obviously, but I, I always loved teaching. And one of the things I really enjoyed about it was breaking down the material into in, in, into ways that you could understand it. And the people who had never seen it before could easily understand it. And I find it incredibly frustrating when you found professors who would talk to hear themselves talk, as I'm rambling on, or would want to make themselves sound good or smart instead of being their main focus to pass the information along to you in ways that you could understand it. And that's something that I always found frustrating and something I always tried to avoid. And something that I'm trying to do here in this show is just give you the information that you need, cover the topics, point out to you the things that will really help you and not try to make it sound overwhelming because a lot of the stuff, you can easily make it sound overwhelming. Obviously the blueprint is huge, but if you take your time and do it slowly, uh, and go through it in a specific manner. It, it, all of this stuff is really not that hard because it's all set up in the same fashion. And you start to realize that as you go through it more and more, you have uh, each disease process, their causes, how the patient presents, their physical exam findings, the tests to diagnose them, how you diagnose it, and then the treatment plans. Now, it's a lot to memorize. It's a lot to remember. 
but it's not complicated, I guess, is what I'm trying to get at. Anyway, let's go ahead and get started with today's show and begin with our primal que- priming questions for venous disorders. Our first priming question is describe Homan sign. Describe Homan sign. Number two, why are DVTs so important to prevent? Why are DVTs so important to prevent? List three risk factors for varicose veins. List three risk factors for varicose veins. All right, so you should take away that and much more from today's show. Let's jump right in to... Thrombophlebitis is where we're going to begin. Thrombophleb- and just moving, marching right through the, the blueprint. Really, really straightforward stuff. Thrombophlebitis is, is um, or rather, phlebitis is an inflammation of a vein. Pretty straightforward. Again, easy. Thrombophlebitis is a venous inflammation as, as a result of a blood clot. The most common cause of phlebitis, I'm sorry, thrombophlebitis is the most common cause of phlebitis. And typically, it's superficial following trauma. So you get a bruise or something, you get banged into, it causes a little clot in that vein, which causes thrombophlebitis. So from thrombophlebitis, we move into superficial thrombophlebitis, which is, I'm going to compare and contrast these a little bit with DVTs because the risk factors and things are the same, but the the outcomes and things are dramatically different. So I'm going to cruise through superficial thrombophlebitis to not totally bore you because it's a little less important, I would say. Uh, So our causes and risk factors here for superficial thrombophlebitis. So this is little clots in veins that are superficial. So along the skin, you can sort of feel them, palpate them. Causes and risk factors here are going to be trauma, oral contraception, smoking, cancer, pregnancy, and then genetic issues. Clinical presentation here is going to be the skin is going to be warm, swollen, and tender to the touch. Physical exam findings, uh, again, the same as the clinical presentation, skin is going to be red, warm, swollen, and tender. So pay attention to those. You can do ultrasounds here. Seems like, you know, I'm not sure the clinical significance, but certainly a Doppler would be on the list of of labs and studies for this condition. Treatment here is going to be heat, NSAIDs, and then elevation of the extremity for sure. Maybe anticoagulants sort of depends on the, the, uh, how bad the situation is and what you think is going on. But really, it's heat and says an elevation of the extremity. And then next, we move into the big one, which is uh, DVTs or deep vein thrombosis. This is, and again, our causes are going to be sort of the same because this is a clot in the vein that causes a problem, which is what superficial thrombophlebitis is. This is deep vein thrombosis, though not superficial. So this is a big clot uh, in a deeper in a deeper vein in a bigger vein. Uh, causes and risk factors here. Again, we have trauma. We also have, and this is a huge one uh, for your exam and for your clinical practice, uh, major surgery, including hip and knee replacements. These people obviously uh, get immediate or get, get immediate post-op anticoagulation, <laughs> anticoagulation because we want to prevent DVTs. Really, really important in your post-operative patients in particular. The surgery itself will e- lead to increased risk of DVT and then prolonged bed rest or immobilization on top of that increases risk for DVT. So we always want to mobilize people as fast as possible after surgery. One reason is to get them moving. Uh, It's, it's, you know, laying in bed is not good for lots and lots of things. DVTs is one of them. You want to get people moving as fast as, as possible without hurting the surgery or creating too much pain for them. But hips and knees and every, and, and spine surgery, we want to get people up the same day, uh, at least uh, the next day if possible uh, and get them moving. But major surgery will be a risk factor for DVTs, and then the prolonged bed rest certainly adds to that substantially. Oral contraception is an increased risk factor. Smoking is an increased risk factor. Put them together, smoking and oral contraception, and we have a a pretty bad setup there. Cancers can be set up for DVTs and and coagulation problems. So keep in mind, any question you get where a patient has a history of cancer, uh, certainly pay attention to DVT issues. Pregnancy, postnatal period can also be an increased risk for DVT, and then genetic clotting issues, uh, family history can certainly be uh, put you at risk for DVT. So pay attention to those in your question stems. Clinical presentation, calf pain. So certainly that deep calf is a good place to get a DVT, one that was probably the most popular, one that we see the most and hear the most about. The skin over that area may be warm and swollen, 
And certainly the calf uh, tenderness is going to be uh, one of the presenting signs. Our physical exam is going to be pretty much the same as the, the presentation. So it's a warm red skin, swollen, and then tender over the calf. The Hellman sign is something that always comes up in this section and always something we documented whenever we're looking at these patients. Uh, pain and tenderness in the calf with passive dorsiflexion of the foot is the Hellman sign. The, of course, the problem with it, and I'm sure you're well aware, is that it's just about useless. Studies of the Hellman sign suggest it's positive for about 8 to 56% of people with a proven DVT. And it's also positive in more than 50% of symptomatic people without DVT. So it's of almost no value whatsoever. We still tend to document it. I, <laughs> and I'm not sure why, but we, we do. Really pretty useless. Anybody with calf pain, calf tenderness after surgery is just going to get it, uh, an ultrasound. It's not expensive. It's not invasive. It is a pain in the butt from an outpatient perspective because the patient's got to go get it done. But the answer is the physical exam doesn't really prove anything. It, it presents an option, sort of points you in a direction and makes you suspicious. And then you send them off for a Doppler to make sure that everything's okay. You can also do an MRI or a CT uh, ven venography. And another possibility for labs is a D-dimer. Uh, this is going to look for fi the fibrin uh, degradation products of a clot. And if it's negative, there's definitely no DVT because there's nothing breaking down. Uh, however, it can be positive for lots and lots of reasons. So it's not it's it's helpful, but it's not diagnostic. Where the ultrasound is going to be diagnostic. Treatment, um, the number one key for treatment for DVTs, and this is big. This is something that you definitely have to understand. The number one treatment for DVTs is prevention. We don't want people to get them in the first place. There's huge pushes in the hospital to make sure nobody gets a, a DVT, and there are lots of things we can do to help prevent people from getting DVTs. And number one is going to be. Uh, well, lifestyle modifications is, is movement is <laughs> just not being, not sitting in one place. You know, the classic question I think for this is the, the, per, uh, you know, a smoker who just traveled from California to New York on a plane gets, uh, comes into your office with calf pain, that sort of thing, because they've been sitting for long periods of time. That's what you're looking for. Someone who's in your question, it's going to be someone who's been set up with some sort of uh, risk factor, and then has been not moving for a long period of time. You want to make sure people are moving, especially people with, with those risk, risk factors. So you want to be exercising, you want to be walking, you want to be moving people. Compression stockings will help. And then in the OR, everyone gets sequential compression devices, which are, if you haven't seen them, it's, uh, let me see how I can describe this. It's kind of like a sleeve that wraps around your calf and then we hook it up to a pump that just blows air in and out. So it's, it's almost like a, a blood pressure cuff. That's the easiest way to describe it. It's almost like a blood pressure cuff. And you put them on both legs. And every couple of minutes, they go up and down and just compress the muscles there and the veins to keep the blood flowing, to keep the blood moving while patients are sedated and not moving. And those stay on the whole time the patient's in the hospital and in the, in the bed. They, they don't ever come off uh, unless there's a contraindication to them, which might be something like a rash or an open wound. Uh, something along those lines, but pretty much everyone across the board winds up with SCDs. Uh, that's just in the order sets, and it's just it's it's a no brainer. They have to absolutely have to have those uh, for surgery. Frequent ambulation, again, I talked about. You want to get people up and moving as fast as you possibly can, and out of bed. I'm, I'm constantly uh, berating patients who are who are lying in bed, saying, "No, no, no, you have to get up. You've got to move." And this is one of the main reasons. Anticoagulation uh, as a preventative measure here. You can do Coumadin, but it takes a couple days to build up, so you're not going to do that immediately post-op. Uh, most post-op patients get Lovenox uh, the morning after surgery. Some docs will start it the evening of surgery, but the majority will start it the following morning because you're also, you know, as you, as you know, with clotting factors, it, it's a very difficult balance between we don't want people to bleed, but we don't want them to clot either. So we don't typically don't give Lovenox immediately postoperatively because we want we don't want to increase our risk for bleeding we start the next day but again some surgeries some docs uh we'll we'll start it that night just sort of depends on what's going on heparin is another quick acting choice uh certainly a possibility there for uh preventative um treatment of a dvt if someone has a dvt if there's an actual um if we if if prevention isn't <laughs> hasn't worked and we and we have a DVT, you're going to do the same anticoagulation therapy. This isn't going to break down the clot, but it's going to prevent from adding to it and prevent new clots from forming. Uh, but it's going to just be anticoagulation therapy. 
um, monitoring it. And then if necessary, um, they're going to go in for surgery and have that clot removed. So a thrombolysis or a thrombectomy. The other possibility is to have them, they may wind up getting a filter in the, in the inferior vena cava. And the reason for that is if you're concerned about the patient getting a PE. Obviously, our, well, not obviously, but our huge concern here is that we, not just the patient gets a DVT, which is painful and annoying and a, and a problem and causes swelling and an overall bad experience. And a, the real issue is that it'll move, that it'll throw through the heart into the, into the lungs and you wind up with a pulmonary embolism and that can kill you. So that's, that's our main, main issue. We do not want to have that happen. So that's why we, we're, we're very aggressive about treating these and preventing them because that is an absolute uh, disaster. We, we, you simply can't have that happen. So an inf uh, a filter will block those clots from getting uh, back to the heart and prevent them from becoming PEs. Varicose veins are next. Causes and risk factors here. Uh, pregnancy, genetic predisposing <laughs> factors, valvular incompetence, not in the heart. Uh, when we're talking about valvular incompetence here, we're talking about the, the valves and the veins, increased abdominal pressure, and then long periods of standing. Clinical presentation, dilated, torturous veins. Torturous is a nice word here. Most commonly the long, saphenous, or its tributaries. This may be painful and tender or asymptomatic. Fatigue and aching of the lower extremities is probably the most common presenting sign. Physical exam findings, again, just those dilated, torturous veins uh, along the long saphenous. And these may be, again, very tender, or they may not be tender at all. Labs and studies, you can do a Doppler here to show the, the incompetent valves. Treatment, our main one, again, this is something that we also want to be preventing and thinking about prevention on and educating patients. We want to be avoiding long periods of standing, elevate the legs when possible, and graduated uh, elastic stockings to help with compression. Compression stockings really help with this. So you'll see a lot of um, nurses on the floor who are on their feet all day long will, uh, <laughs> will wear compression stockings, and that really helps to prevent some of this stuff. Uh, surgery down the road, uh, vein stripping and sclerotherapy are two ways of treating this, and they come out really well. Um, I actually know a couple of people who had this done and absolutely love it. They're in a lot of pain, and then afterwards really felt pretty good. Chronic venous insufficiency is next. This is the weakened vessel walls and incompetent valves generally in the lower extremities. So this is sort of everything sort of leaking back. This is really is a step beyond varicose veins. Clinical presentation is progressive edema beginning at the ankles and moving up. Skin changes, you get some hyperpigmentation. So you get that purpley, ready, uh, yucky looking ankles. Uh, they're typically very swollen. They're shiny, they're atrophic. You get some dermatitis, and then you get, it just gets that that very distinct look of venous insufficiency, where everything is just kind of uh, red and shiny and purpley and just kind of yucky. If you're, once you start seeing it, it will become very, very obvious to you. It is uh, not an uncommon problem that we see. And then the question that we always get, the ulcers that are associated with Venous insufficiency are painful ulcerations, painful ulcerations. Physical exam findings, uh, like I said, it's similar to, the, to, to our clinical presentation. It's those skin changes, that progressive edema in the ankles, especially um, that hyperpigmentation, the atrophic, uh, and then painful ulcer ulcerations. We can do ultrasound Dopplers to, to show this, but again, you're going to learn a lot here from your physical exam. Treatment is going to be, uh, well, again, it's going to be behavioral changes. Avoid long periods of standing, elevate the legs when possible, graduated uh, compression stockings, heat, and then ambulatory exercise. you got to keep moving to get that fluid out of there. Oh, and that brings us to the end of uh, our venous disorders and this section of uh, vascular disease. We will move into arterial disease uh, in, in the next show, and we'll cover that over there. Real quick, before I, before we get our answers to our priming questions, I want to talk about some, a little bit of time management stuff. I've been reading uh, the work of a guy named Dan Kennedy, who is extreme in the sense of time management and guarding his time. And I don't know that I can go as far as he has, but I can absolutely understand the value in what he presents. And let me just give you a couple examples. He is a, a, a prolific writer. He's written hun, you know tons of books, tons of articles. He, you, his main way of being so prolific and being able to do so much is 
well, there's a couple of ways, but the, the one that stood out the most to me was these long blocks of uninterrupted time. You cannot interrupt him. I, I mean, physically, he does not own a smartphone. He does not have an internet connection at his house. He's not, he understands what all these things are. He's not just, uh, but he knows the value of his time and he understands what happens with those temptations, with those things. He does not use email. He does not use text messaging. If you want to get in touch with him, he has, and the guy makes a couple million dollars a year, as far as I understand. He has one person working for him and has made sure that that person lives across the country from him because he does not want them interrupting him. He does not want to interrupt that person. So he has it set up so that you can contact his secretary and her only access to him is by fax. That's it. Oh, they do talk, I think, once a day for about 10 minutes. And all you do is you fax things to her and then she puts them into a bin and FedExes them to him once a week. That's the way that you contact him. That's the way that he works with all of his clients, all of his publishing companies. He is, that's the only way. He will set up in a phone call appointment, but he will not allow someone to call and interrupt him in his work. Amazing that you can get so much done. I just find that I, we, we spend so much time complaining about how little time we have. We don't have time to get this done. We don't have time to get that done. Uh, but I, I'm also then shocked about, you know, when I look up how much time I probably spend in my email, uh, how much time I spend, you know, just looking up material for this show and then just wind up down a rabbit hole someplace really not doing anything relevant. Or, uh, you know, I get a text from someone or a phone call from someone and it interrupts you. And his major point is to be constantly guarding your time and constantly understanding that it's the most valuable resource you have. You know, if you're in school, you're paying thousands and thousands of dollars in the hopes of passing this exam and passing school if you're wasting your time, if you're not guarding your time like it's the most important thing you have, you, you have a big issue. You have a big problem because you cannot let this opportunity uh, get away from you. It, it is the most important thing you have. It's, it, it is worth thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, you know, there was, uh, I think the AAPA, the student AAPA tweeted out something this week about, a, you know, how, how is studying going? And I wrote it up in an email. And the answer was, you know, the guy holding up a pie chart and it was 60% procrastination and 40% bothering other people or distracting other people. And that's probably really true. We probably spend 15, 20% of our time actually sitting and doing the work. We spend a ton of our time being distracted or distracting others or being interrupted. And it's that deep, long blocks of work is where you're going to get the most stuff done, where it's most important for you, uh, where the most things are going to stick in your brain. If you're flighting from thing to thing, and then you're wondering, how come you don't have enough time and how come nothing sticks in your head? Well, there's a really good reason for that. Uh, and it doesn't have to do with how smart you are. It doesn't have to do with the material you're covering or how boring your professor is. It has to do with none of that. Uh, it has to do with how you're handling the situation, how you're spending your time. So anyway, I've been working more and more on my time management stuff, on trying to get as much done as possible and really working on that focused, uh, intense periods or blocks of time. I just find that keeps coming up and again and again when I research this stuff. The the most the people who are best at it tend to really set aside those those uninterrupted blocks and work work with those. So uh, so <laughs> that so let's move on from there. Uh, one thing I did want to point out before I close out the show and we get to the the answers to the priming questions is I have been talking about uh, a new section, a new division of physician assistant exam review that I'm I'm creating. Uh, it hasn't taken complete form yet. As of right now, uh, the idea is something along the line of a video newsletter material that's going to come out on a, on a routine basis that's going to cover things like uh, how to find your first job, how to find any job, how to get through interviews, how to answer test questions, the best ways uh, to, to build your study habits, the best ways to focus on heart murmurs and understand those. And, and, and then I'm going to cover some content in other episodes, things like that. At some point down the road, it's going to turn into more of a community where we can communicate more uh, between other PAs and myself and where I can do a little bit more hands-on teaching, uh, things of that nature. It's going to start out, like I said, a little bit slower as I build it out, but that's sort of uh, the initial plan. So what I wanted to just let you in on, let you know right now, is I, 
I'm going to set up a an opt-in page for people to subscribe to find out the most and the earliest and be the early adopters on this and really help me get this off the ground. Um, and you're going to be able to find that at physicianassistantexamreview.com backslash new is going to be where I'm going to leave that. Um, you know, if you're listening to this two years from now, that page may be different. But for this week, for the next couple of weeks until I launch this thing, it's you're going to be able to find that opt-in page at physician assistant exam review backslash new is where I'm going to uh, have you go ahead and sign up there. And that way you'll be sure to get as much of the information as you possibly can, as early as you possibly can, and get in on that on the ground floor. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how I'm going to treat it, whether I'm going to limit the initial people in, uh, something along those. I, I don't know, just to, to try to build it out uh, in the way I, I can get some feedback on. I don't know. We'll, I'll think about it. But either way, if you're interested, uh, I've had some people express interest already. Definitely go um, over to that page and sign up and, and you'll be the first to get the information there. Priming question. Uh, describe home and sign. That was passive dorsiflexion. Passive dorsiflexion. Uh, if they have pain with that, that's a positive home and sign, which is an indicator of absolutely nothing. Why are DVTs so important to prevent? Uh, the answer there is we don't want them to go on to be PEs. We don't want pulmonary embolisms. We're trying to prevent a pulmonary embolism, especially in our post-operative patients. List three risk factors for varicose veins. Um, standing long hours, pregnancy, genetic predisposition. What else did I have? I'll leave it at that for now. Any of those three, uh, I think I had six or seven of those. Any of those would be absolutely great. Thank you so much for joining me again here today at Physician Assistant Exam Review. The numbers for the downloads have continued to go up dramatically. So thank you for passing it along to your friends and letting other people know. Uh, I really appreciate that. It really uh, obviously helps stroke my ego and makes me feel like uh, people are listening and it makes a big difference to uh, to how I put this material out there. So thank you so much for that feedback on the show. is always appreciated. You can reach me at uh, bwallace at physicianassistantexamreview.com. And I strongly encourage you to head on over to physicianassistantexamreview.com backslash new to check out the new stuff that I'm going to have going on and sign up for that uh, so we can get a better line of communication going there. All right, great. Until next week, or next time when we talk about arterial disorders, uh, good luck on all your exams this, <laughs> this period. Uh, good luck and I'll talk to you soon. Take care.